I'm Amy Dolan, and this is the Feeding People Podcast. everyone. Welcome to Feeding People. I'm Amy Dolan, your host. Feeding People is a show about the magic that happens around the table as people share food with each other. Listen, I am wasting no time today in getting to today's episode and today's guest because I am just so, so excited. My guest today is the fabulous Julia Tertian. Last week, I had the opportunity to record this episode with Julia. Julia Tertian is a cookbook author. She has written the cookbook Small Victories and Now and Again, which I just love. She's also written a book that has been very, very meaningful to me called Feed the Resistance. Not only is Julia a cookbook author, she is also a podcast host of the very wonderful show Keep Calm and Cook On with Julia Tertian. I love that podcast. It's a can't miss for me every single week. My favorite episodes are when she interviews Samin Nasrat and Anthony from Queer Eye. I mean, please go listen to those episodes. They're just fantastic. As I read her cookbooks and listened to her show, I just knew that I had to ask her the connection that she sees between food and revolution. And let me tell you, (laughs) that conversation did not disappoint. That's it. That's the intro. Here is my conversation with Julia Tertian. Enjoy. Julia, thank you so much for being on the show today. I can't believe this is happening. Oh my gosh, Um, my pleasure. Your podcast, Keep Calm and Cook On, is my favorite. Your guests are fantastic. You're just a fantastic host. I love listening to it. I feel like I'm taking notes on like how to be a better host when I'm (laughs) listening to your show. But you're just so cool and you ask such good questions and just feels like you're sitting with a a friend talking about food and life. And so thanks so much for being on today. Oh, my gosh. Um, Thank you. That was so kind. Yeah, no, it's like been the best excuse ever to just ask people all these questions I want to (laughs) know. Yeah. Is that like your is that like your normal posture anyway? Do you just that's how it comes across that you just love to like sit down and ask people good questions? Yeah, I mean, I really do. I I do love that. But I feel like when you um, I mean, as you probably very well now like I think when you introduce like a microphone into it I don't know it gives you permission to ask some more things you might not normally ask yes um so yeah I really enjoy it but I am I think in general just like a very curious person and very curious about you know other people and just how we're all figuring things out so yeah it's been a lot of fun thank you that was very kind well it's great I have more kind things to say so prepare yourself (laughs) um but how would you introduce yourself Um, I would say my name is Julia, and I am a cookbook author, and yeah, I host a podcast, and I really love food, and I really love people. That's it. That's all of it. I love it. (laughs) (laughs) And dogs. I also really love dogs. Oh, do you have a dog? Oh, we have two, and like we treat them like human beings and very attached. Yes. Okay. Well, let's talk about this. Who, what are the names? What kind of dogs? Oh my gosh. We could talk about this for like an hour. Yeah. Um, their names are Hope and Winky and they are both <laughs> rescues who came with their names. Um, they're actually both from Puerto Rico from this um, rescue group called the Sato Project. And we also have a cat who I always forget to include, but um, <laughs> yeah, they're, I'm, I'm very, very attached to our pets and just yeah I think dogs are like life is just better with dogs in my opinion I guess unless you're allergic yeah (laughs) absolutely we got our um we have a three-year-old pit bull that we rescued uh two years ago named Maddox and he's just like the love of our lives yeah we love him so much yeah yeah we can exchange some pictures (laughs) afterwards yeah well since you know that feeling (laughs) Like, careful um, what you I, ask for. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay, so you've, like, we mentioned the podcast. You're also a cookbook author, right? Mm-hmm. And I um, love your cookbooks. Thank and you. my friend gave me your book, Feed the Resistance. Early 2017, I was creating a dinner church here in Chicago called Sunday Supper Church. And we were trying to see if 
the magic of eating together at a table could translate into church and a faith experience. And as we were doing that, we were realizing when we gathered together at the tables, we also, the food like nourished us and strengthened us and empowered us to go out and fight some injustices here in the city. And so it was kind of the first time I saw all of those things come together for myself, food, faith, and um, activism. Mm -hmm. And a friend gave me your book and I was like, what? (laughs) (laughs) This is kind of what I'm talking about. So how did the book come to get, well, thank you for the book. It's meant so much to me. And how did this come about? Um, Well, it's super, like, makes me super excited and happy to hear your experience of the book. Um, The book came out, so it came out in the fall of 2017, um, and it was absolutely sort of, like, born out of the, you know, most recent presidential election. Um, And basically, yeah, long story short, I was on deadline (laughs) to do a whole other cookbook that had nothing to do with um, politics or activism in any type of way. And then the election happened and I felt um, just a lot of things, (laughs) (laughs) including like just scared and um, yeah, tons of adjectives, like insert whichever one you want. And so I, I, yeah, I wrote to my editor who I was working with at at the time and I said, you know, can we put the other book on hold for a second and can we make a cookbook that is about, um, yeah, about making the world hopefully a little bit better through food and all the different ways you can do that. And we did it. We did it super, super quickly. And by we, I mean the over 20 contributors who gave either recipes or essays to the book. And it's such a, it's like a book kind of built by a community for so many communities. And yeah, there's recipes in it, there's essays, and it's all ways to kind of give back to your community. And food just lets us do that in so many different ways. So the book really celebrates that it's full of ideas. It's it's really like a resource guide is kind mm-hmm. of how I think of it. Um, and yeah, it was awesome because we got to include all those people. Um, and we also gave all of the proceeds from the book to the ACLU. So just by purchasing the book, like just doing that, you know, you don't even have to right. open it. I mean, I encourage you to, but <laughs> just purchasing right. the book kind of helps, you know, protect civil liberties, which is sort of like an amazing thing. And I doing that book, you know, which is now um, it's been two years since it came out, like probably close to three years since I started working on it. And making that book really kind of changed my my work and changed my life. And um, I mean, those are like big things to say, but I I mean it because I, I, you know, I got to know everyone who contributed to the book. Um, So I got to really expand my community in this way that has been very, very meaningful And it really taught me, you know, that a cookbook can be so many things. Like, sure, like a cookbook can help you, like, figure out what to make for dinner. But it can also help you figure out how to, you know, get involved in wherever you live. And it can, you know, help raise money. And it can help expand a community. You know, it can do all these things. And so that was, like, a a super just um, empowering and, uh, yeah, like, just, yeah, gave me a lot of... um, of pride in what I do in this way that I hadn't felt before. I mean, I've always felt really proud of my work, but this felt like, oh, this is, this is bigger than me, which is a cool feeling. That's so beautiful. And I mean, I'm one little person who's saying it, it it was bigger than you, of course. I mean, the way that it impacted me and our community here in Chicago, but yeah, that it's so cool that in the process of creating it, it also changed your own life. Um, what do, what have you noticed since? Like, how is food connected to resistance and privilege and power? Has anything new emerged in you since writing the book? Oh, my gosh. Well, it's it's I should say a lot has emerged for me that feels new to me, but it's not anything new. <laughs> um, but it's helped me understand things that have been true for a very, very long time. And I think food has always been tied to revolution. Um, And that, Mm -hmm. you know, as you know, the minute you take bread away from people, rice, you know, whatever is the staple, like, that's when really terrible things have happened. Mm -hmm. Um, But food has also been the answer in in Mm -hmm. lots of terrible moments in time. And, you know, it's it's kind of reshaped the lens that I I look at history with. And, you know, you see these moments of, um, 
of, you know, civil uprising and um, amazing moments of, you know, just civil rights happening in history. And they tend to happen around food, you know, like Mm -hmm. so much of the gay rights movement, you know, Mm -hmm. Stonewall is a bar, (laughs) Um, you know, like the Compton cafeteria, like it was, you know, a place where people ate, you know, these things happen in places where people gather and people gather around food. And, you know, food can also be used to really, um, you know, truly feed the resistance. Um, You know, it's part of the why I chose that title for the book. And um, one person who I think about all the time and who I learned about in making Feed the Resistance um, is a woman named uh, Miss Georgia Gilmore, who is very, very active in the civil rights movement. Um, And I learned about her through one of the contributors to the book, whose name is Cheryl Day, who is an amazing, amazing person, one of the best, if not the best bakers in this country. Mm. She runs a bakery called called Back in the Day Bakery in Savannah. Um, She's just like the kindest person. And so she uh, did a recipe for Feed the Resistance. Um, Cheryl made these, they're like so delicious, these like chocolate espresso pie Mm -hmm. bars that are like so decadent and so good. And she was inspired to make that recipe by Georgia Gilmore. And Georgia Gilmore ran something called the Club from Nowhere during the Civil Rights Movement. And the Club from Nowhere was a group of other women like her who were black women who worked as cooks or, um, you know, in kind of like, you know, households and different occupations like that. And they couldn't afford to be on the front lines of the movement. You know, it would mean risking their jobs. Most of them were working for white families. Mm -hmm. And they quite literally fed the civil rights movement. So they would prepare... Um, cakes and sandwiches and chicken and all these different foods. And they would sell all that food to all the people who were boycotting in Montgomery, um, who are, you know, boycotting the buses. And they would sell the food because people had to eat something (laughs) during, Mm -hmm. you know, this moment. Um, So they needed something to eat. And then they would take the money and put it right back into the movement. So there was something called the Montgomery Improvement Association. And they did things like buy tires for the cars and buy gasoline for the cars that were transporting people. Because just, you know, just because people weren't getting on the bus didn't mean they didn't have to get to where they were going. You know, so there were all these things that were happening. And Georgia Gilmore and all these women were feeding them and then using the money to pay for all the stuff. And they really used food to just fuel it and make it happen mm-hmm. and, you know, show up for their community. And it's just like amazing. And it's so cool that to me that they called it the club from nowhere. And it's very mm-hmm. kind of clever because when anyone asked, you know, where the money came from, they would just say it came from nowhere. <laughs> and They were yes. telling the oh truth, my gosh. Yes. but you know, they couldn't, you know, <laughs> yes. be caught or anything. And she went on to run kind of like this restaurant out of her house. And I guess, you know, I've read a lot about her, John T. Edge, who runs the Southern Foodways Alliance. He wrote about her in his last book. And um, I think Martin Luther King was like not only a regular at her kind of house restaurant, but he also was like an investor. And the most poignant thing about her, and there's, you know, plenty of poignant things, but um, she, on the day she passed away, she had been cooking um, and she was making, you know, big pans of food and at her service, they serve the food that she mm. made. <laughs> so, oh my you know, right until the end. I mean, yes. it's, it's unbelievable. So, you know, I got to learn about Georgia Gilmore from putting together Feed the Resistance because Cheryl told me about her and then we got to, you know, include that story so other people could learn about her and then they could make Cheryl's recipe, you know, and they could kind of really remember it because not only did you read about this phenomenal woman, you've also made this thing and then you really remember it. So yeah, that's just, you know, one example. Wow. What is it about food? I feel like I'm always (laughs) trying to like understand its magic. Yeah. It's hard to put words on. Yeah. 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 I I I can try, but it's, it's hard. I think it's hard because it's actually really simple. I think, Mm. you know, I think food is something we all have in common. And like, you know, it's this need that we all, and by we, I mean like literally every person in the world, like we all have it in common and we all need it and we can all relate to it. So it's this unbelievably like personal thing, but also like totally universal. So There's that. Um, You know, I think cooking in and of itself is like this magical thing that we do. Like I've cooked my entire life. I cook pretty much every day. And, I and you know, usually I'm not thinking about Mm -hmm. this in these terms. But like when I stop and think about it, it's like it's amazing that you can turn these things into something you can eat. You know, it's it's really amazing. And I also believe so much. And, you know, I, I got to write about this in the introduction to Feed the Resistance. I think there's something about cooking specifically at home that 
is, you know, it's such an individual experience. It's something most of us do by ourselves. Um, but we, when we do it, we are in this like amazing moment of solidarity with so many other mm. people. And, you know, I think about it when I'm, you know, slicing onions and, you mm. know, peeling carrots and stuff and these things that yes. can be like a little bit boring. And then I just stop and think about, you know, there's so many other people doing this exact same mm. thing at this exact same time. And I like every time I think about that, it just, I don't know, it like it, it makes me feel part of something. And mm -hmm. I think that's really valuable. And I think also when we feed people, you know, it's such an act of love. Yes. Um, and it's, you know, it's such a gift. And it's such, it's such glue, you know, to hold yes. people together, families, friends, whoever it might be. And so I think all those things, and you know, there's plenty more, it's just, it's a really powerful thing. And it's, you know, and it's something we can often take for granted, because it's, you know, such a part of our everyday lives. But I think that's where the power is, because mm -hmm. it's, it is part of our everyday lives. And yes. it has all this power to it. So yes. that's sort of oh. unbelievable. I've never thought about the uniting factor on the side of cooking amongst all of us. I only just think about how we all need to eat and mm -hmm. how that connects us as humans. I've never thought, I love that you said that. I've never thought about how when I'm cooking in my kitchen, so many other people are doing the same thing with such similar ingredients. Yeah. And that also unites us and connects us in our humanity. I've just never thought of that side of it. Yeah. And I think specifically, I mean, I usually, when I when I do think about that, I'm usually thinking about other women who are doing the same yes. thing at the same time. Yes. Um, and, you know, just, yeah, I keep using the word power, but I think there is just such power in that, you know, this collective of, of women across the world. And it's amazing. Right. It's like, what other things are there even in life that we're all doing, mm -hmm. you know, around the same time or every single day? Probably aren't many things. Breathing, mm -hmm. maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Drinking water, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so too. <laughs> um, is cooking a creative outlet for you? I always wonder, like people who cook professionally, can, is it also creative or is it, does it mostly feel like work? I, I mean, it totally feels creative to me, um, but it also does often feel like work because it is work. Yeah. I mean, yeah. cooking is like physical labor. Like, and I think yeah. that's, you know, it's, it's very easy to romanticize it. And sometimes it's, you know, like you're just hungry and it's time to make dinner and it doesn't have to be like a poem, <laughs> you know, yes. Um, yes. but it definitely does like fuel my creativity. And it's, it's really remarkable to me that I've, you know, I've loved to cook my entire life and I still feel excited about it. And I love figuring out, um, you know, if we're having friends over, I love thinking about what we're going to make. Mm. If, if a holiday is coming up, I love planning that. I love just making dinner for my wife and like, you know, thinking about something she would enjoy and you know, is there some creative spin on that I can make? And when I write my cookbooks, my favorite part is just figuring out like my list of, of recipes, like the table of contents. And it feels like this mm. little puzzle I get to put together and think about. And, you know, if I'm going to include a recipe, you know, why is it worth including? And how am I going to make this thing particular to me? Or what story am I going to share? So it's like a total creative process that I, I love. But yeah, sometimes, you know, peeling the onion is just peeling the onion yeah <laughs> <laughs> right nothing creative in that <laughs> we I made chili for our church on Sunday night and there was just so many damn onions I was yeah. losing my mind and I was just like there's I hate this there's nothing <laughs> fun about this and like I wish I wasn't doing this and I'm like wow you're amazing Amy <laughs> like that's when you true, put a podcast like, on yeah <laughs> pastoral spirit like <laughs> cooking for your church with this kind of attitude I'm like no some days it goes like that like like some days it just goes like that. Yeah, that's all right. That's okay. The yeah, the food's totally. still gonna be fine. Yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned always cooking mm -hmm. and always um, being interested in cooking. Tell me more about what cooking was like for you as a kid, or uh, food was like while you were growing up. Like, how did you? I'm always so curious how people are interested in cooking at such a young age. Yeah, I mean, I wish I could tell you like why I got interested in it, um, but I, I I just can't remember. <laughs> I just <Yeah. laughs> like have always always been interested in it. I've always wanted to be in the kitchen. Um, I think part of it. I mean, I've definitely thought a lot about this. I think part of it was that I grew up around a lot of. Um, books and specifically around lots of cookbooks and 
books about um, kind of like homes and design and stuff because mm. my parents worked in publishing um, and they mostly worked in magazines and they also designed like books on the side. Um, so I just grew up around just lots of the things that I now work in, you know, like mm. books and magazines and these types wow. of things. Um, so I was exposed to them from like a really young age. So I think that has a big part of it because I was really drawn to them. Like I definitely treated cookbooks like, you know, kind of my version of a children's book. And, mm. you know, they're a safe thing to give kids like, you know, <laughs> like, yes. you know, things are going to work out. Like I feel like so, mostly. Like, yeah, sometimes. no, that's true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I loved watching people cook on TV. And I, when I was a kid, it was before the Food Network started, but I would just watch um, public television like mm. constantly and just anyone cooking on TV. I just loved watching them. And I used to watch the show Great Chefs on the Discovery Channel. And mm. this is like a sidebar and not an answer to your question. But I like my one of my favorite interviews I've gotten to do is I tracked down Mary Lou Conroy, who did all the voiceover for Great Chefs. You never oh, saw her. My gosh. But she was like the voice of my childhood. Like she narrated <laughs> my childhood oh my and gosh she's like 91 I think and she lives in this like assisted living facility outside of New Orleans and we had this phone call and I got to record it and it's like I still can't believe I got to do that it was just amazing um what was and it her like voice, hearing her, her voice, voice sounds the same well, I, was, yeah. I was like oh my god I know you like I know this voice <laughs> and she kept apologizing because she was like oh I'm older now like my voice doesn't sound the same I was like no I know exactly who's on the other yeah. line <laughs> um so yeah anyway so I would yeah read tons of cookbooks I watched people cook on TV. And, you know, I found a lot of um, happiness in those things. Mm. And it also made me feel really like safe and taken care of to watch people prepare food or to read about it. And I think that's a big part of what drew me mm. to the kitchen when I was young and continues to draw me to the kitchen. It's like, it's absolutely where I feel the most safe and taken mm. care of. And, you know, I'm really fortunate that I grew up in a very safe home. And, you know, I was taken care of, but my parents worked full time since before I was born. And, they weren't around like a ton, like especially during the week. And mm -hmm. I was very much raised not only by them, but also by my childhood babysitter, who I, I still am very, very close to. And uh, her name is Jenny. And Jenny and I just hung out in the kitchen all the time. And not that she was necessarily cooking or I was, but it's just that's where we were. Um, you yeah. know, I think that's true for plenty of people. Like, you know, you hang out in the kitchen in your house and... Um, but Jenny really let me cook and my parents really let me cook. You know, I didn't have like an easy bake oven or anything like that. They really let me be in the kitchen and it was really empowering as a kid. And I, um, I think, yeah, I felt like safe in the kitchen, but I also felt, yeah, empowered. And I got to feel kind of like in charge in this way that mm -hmm. I, I didn't in other parts of my life. You know, I had an older brother and we had kind of a tough time growing up. And But when I was in the kitchen, like it was my show, you know, like mm -hmm. and that was a great feeling. So I think all of that has like really been a huge part of why I cook now, but definitely got me in the kitchen when I was younger. And it's also kind of how I got to know Jenny, too, because we have really different upbringings. You know, I grew up in New York and, you know, she was a big part of raising me. And I had like a, you know, very like privileged life. And I was this, you know, little white Jewish girl in New mm -hmm. York. And Jenny is from St. Vincent, which is like an island nation in the Caribbean. And she would always cook um, like Vincentian food for herself. And I always wanted to eat whatever she was having. And she yeah. would share her food with me. And it's really like, how I got to know her and, you know, mm. you know, ask her about where that food came from. And I loved it. And I just wanted to eat it all the time. So I feel like from such a young age, before I had any language around any of this, I just I knew that like, food that wasn't the food you, you know, your family made or mm -hmm. that you grew up with, like, it was a way to get to know someone. So wow. yeah, that's a I, long answer to your question. <laughs> I, I love it. <laughs> What do you what do you say to parents? I feel like so many parents ask like how to get their kids. Mm. Um, usually, it's like how to get their kids eating better, right? Sure, yeah. But it's to me always the answer is like, well, involve them in the process of cooking. Um, what do you say? Like, is that something you want? You find often people wondering like how to get their kids more involved in trying new things, or I don't know, maybe parents who want to get their kids cooking. Yeah, I mean, I definitely hear those kinds of questions a lot. I mean, I really 
can't speak firsthand because, um, yeah, we just have dogs. <laughs> we don't have <laughs> actual human beings we're raising. Your um, dog doesn't cook? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but they're very interested in food. Um, so, yeah, it's easy for me, of course, to say, like, yeah, get your kids involved yeah. in the kitchen. Then they'll be into food. But I'm not the one who's having to clean up after you've, like, you know, baked yes. cookies with a kid and there's, like, flour and sugar everywhere. Yes. So I think... I mean, it's definitely something I've observed with family and friends with young kids. And, you know, I think when you get kids in the kitchen, it's going to be a little messy, like, and it might take a little longer, you know, it's not going to be as efficient as just one, you know, very capable adult in the kitchen. And so I think it's something to just maybe lean into, I guess, Mm -hmm. um, and not fight and, Again, super easy for me to say because I'm not, sure. you know, <laughs> following them with like a broom. Um, <laughs> but I think I think doing that, I think also like if, you know, I, I guess doing whatever it is you do anyway with just mm-hmm. a little bit more intention. So if you're a family that goes out to eat a lot, you know, trying to get your kids involved in cooking when you don't actually cook at home very much, like it's going to be double hard. So maybe like vary where you go out to eat and, you know, introduce them to new foods and stuff like that. You know, I think there's, there's all different ways. And, you know, maybe it's just having, you know, cookbooks around in the house Mm -hmm. that, you know, are available to them. And there's all different like entry points to it. So yeah, I don't think there's one right answer. But I think, yeah, I think the more from, yeah, what I've observed, I think the more kids can, come to something kind of on their own and be excited about it instead of it being kind of like pushed on them. Yes. Um, that seems to be a good yes. thing. But I mean, I really have no idea what I'm talking about. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, that was a really great answer for not knowing what you're talking about. So um, my niece is very, she's 10 and she is similar to, to you. She just has loved cooking from like the first minute she was born, basically. And I love that my sister just goes with it. Like she Mm. just, she lets her, like in the summer, she lets her ride her, ride her bike to the grocery store to pick out all the ingredients. She, you know, has her money. She comes back. She's got the ingredients. She makes up the menu for dinner, feeds the whole family. Wow. And I'm just like, I know I'm always so impressed by the control my sister lets go of in doing that, you know, like and my sister's like, well, there's going to be a better meal than I could have made. So it's great. You know, it's going to work out. But I love how you said that, like just kind of following your kids' curiosity. And if they're interested, go for it. Like give them more chances. And if they're not, don't force it. Like just help them eat good food when they can and be be present at the table together. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about cookbooks specifically. Mm -hmm. Um, Cookbooks are just like my favorite thing in the world. Like I I think for my birthday, I got six new cookbooks from family and friends. And it was like... I just buried myself under the covers for like a whole weekend with the cookbooks, like reading every page, looking at the pictures, thinking of new ideas, parties, all of it. So for you in creating cookbooks and writing the recipes, like what do you imagine when someone like me buys one? Like what's the power? What's the magic in putting a cookbook into the world? Oh my gosh. Um, I love that question. It's, it's, it's an amazing feeling. And I think it's especially kind of like amazing to get to be a cookbook author, like in the age of social media. So, Mm -hmm. you know, like you and I can connect in this way and I can hear that from you. Like, that's amazing. Um, But also because people will post pictures of what they cook from the, you know, the recipes. And it's it's so like surreal to see these recipes that, Mm -hmm. you know, have meant so much to you and you've worked hard on to to write and test and make sure they work and photograph and all the stuff, like all the work that goes into making a cookbook. And then all of a sudden, like someone's actually making it and then they're like sharing it and you can see it like in their house. Like I, like when my first cookbook came out and that was happening, like I would like cry, like every time I was like, Oh my God, they're actually making it. Like, (laughs) um, so it's, yeah, it's such a cool feeling. It's hard to describe. It's really, Mm -hmm. um, it, it does feel like such a privilege to get to put yourself out there and, you know, I mean, I can only speak for myself to put myself out there and and my stories and this food that is so meaningful to me and I have put so much thought into and to have it be, you know, well received is like, Mm -hmm. it's an amazing feeling. And it's, yeah, definitely one I don't take for granted. So yeah, I wish I had like a better word than like amazing, but yeah, that's really how it feels. Yeah. That must be the most wonderful thing to see someone make a recipe that you loved and put your heart and soul into and 
yeah, to imagine them making it for themselves or someone special in their lives, just I, that must be amazing. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the right word. It's it's cool because it's, you know, there's so many different like forms of, of work that so many people put out into the world, um, you know, a painting or mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> like a sermon or, you know, whatever yeah. it might be. And the I think something that's really particular and really interesting about recipes being like your creative medium, as they are for me, is that you know, not only do you put it out there, but people kind of make them their own. And it becomes this thing that's, you know, you're connected to, but then you become kind of disconnected from. And to me, that's kind of like when the magic Mm. really happens, because, you know, it's, it's, again, it's sort of like I was talking about with Feed the Resistance, like, it becomes bigger than you. And like, and that to me is like, super cool. And like, I love hearing from people say like, oh, you know, I liked your recipe for whatever, chicken soup. But like I added this, this, and this and kind of made it my own and like, oh, sorry, is that okay? And I'm like, oh, my God, that's the best. Like I love that. (laughs) Like I love when a recipe of mine is something that can be kind of like a like a little guiding kind of light. Like it doesn't have to be like a – it's not like a prescription. Like I don't don't care if you follow it exactly. Like it it will work if you do and I hope you're pleased with the result. Yeah. but if it means that you took a minute to make something you might not normally mm-hmm. make or, you know, you made something and you shared it with someone who you care about, like, those are the things that feel really meaningful to me. That's so beautiful. And I feel like you're a way better person than me because I feel like if someone said that to me, <laughs> one of my recipes, I'd be like, that's great. But mine was better, <laughs> better right? Like, I mean, yours was probably good. It got you cooking. But like, Mine was, it did taste better, right? Let's, maybe we could say that. Oh, I mean, it's so, I feel like, I mean, I totally get that. But I also don't, my like, I feel like it's like my like dirty secret is like, I love writing recipes. Like the process of it is so, like, I feel like it's so, it's all details. You know, it's like down to half a teaspoon. It's like so particular. And I get really into that. And I love that. And I love the parameters. Um, but I also don't, I don't ever follow recipes. Right, <laughs> like I right. test my own, yeah. of course, like of multiple course. times, but I don't ever follow recipes. So like the idea of someone not following my recipe to a T, I'm like, yeah, that's the point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> right. That makes sense. If you're not following recipes, then great. Of course. Yeah. No one needs like to. <laughs> I can't hold anyone else to that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So can we talk for a minute about your Jewish faith? Sure. Um, my... I'm half Jewish and um, my mom's side of the family is Jewish. And so I was raised um, Jewish and Christian. And now at this point in my life, I feel like it's the Jewish part of me that is why I love food and Mm. why I love gathering Mm -hmm. people. And I'm always trying to like understand that better. And all I can really understand is like the memories I have of my mom and my grandmother and my great grandmother and um, the ways that they cooked for us um, around the holidays, the the ways that they, you know, shoved us out the door with food, (laughs) like all of those things. And so for you, how does your Jewish faith connect with food and feeding people and, you know, gathering together for great meals, if it connects at all. Oh, it absolutely connects. I feel like my, like, everything about me that identifies as Jewish yeah. is about food, <laughs> like 100%. Wow. Wow. Like, I, I absolutely would describe myself as a Jew. Like, I think I am Jewish, but I'm not like a practicing Jew. I don't mm-hmm. consider myself a very religious person. Um and, you know, Judaism means very different things for yes. all sorts of people. But um, I, yeah, for me, like when I say I'm Jewish, it's not because I go to synagogue regularly at all. Like, mm-hmm. um, it's because of the family I grew up in and the meals we had that had these like very distinctly Jewish foods. And it's around the meals we had at holidays, but also the meals we had at like delicatessens and, yes. um, you yeah. know, stuff like that. And that to me is like, that was what meant being Jewish to me was eating these particular foods, sometimes on particular days, um, or going to, you know, certain restaurants and having, again, particular foods in a particular setting. And so I absolutely think like, for myself, and I think for many people, there's just such a huge correlation Mm -hmm. between uh, being Jewish and eating certain types of food. And yeah, it's super, super strong. And those foods like mm-hmm. carry so much meaning with yeah. them. 
Yeah. And it, like, yeah, I feel like, like, I mean, like sort of like a stereotype, but is, I mean, at least for like the like New York Jewish family I grew mm-hmm. up in, it's like, yeah, that's like, that's how people say they love you. Like yes, they make yes. you extra food. They yes. send you home with it. You know, you get this big portion somewhere. Like it's absolutely wrapped up in, in all that. Oh, yeah. Like if my if my mom has made us a big meal and my entire family walks out with like if it's just the right amount of food for everyone and everyone goes home with nothing like she's that's a total failure. <laughs> of, of, that's how she feels. <laughs> you know, it's like you. she's planning like giant containers that you're taking everything home. And it's yeah. just like like you can say no 10 times that you don't need that food or that you just grocery shopped and you're going to walk out of there with all those containers of food. And that's that's how she loves us. Yeah. And a thousand I, I, percent. Yeah. <laughs> I feel all that love. Um, that's, that's so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. And I love, um, to me even more than like the, the Christian tradition part of my faith, the food that's connected to the holidays specifically and the Jewish faith and the symbolism that goes with it is just so rich and deep and meaningful. Um, we have communion in the Christian faith, Yeah, but I mean, that's kind of it. And, um, I love it. We we hosted our first um, Seder this year in our apartment, and it's just like every little thing you you eat and taste. Oh, it me- everything and means something. Everything. Yeah, everything. Yeah, and it's I think so that's special. so cool. And I I love all the symbolism and like the writer in me, especially like loves all of it. And it's also I think like as a kid, it's like the only way I really like kind of understood what all that stuff was about. Yes, I was like right. all these things people were saying. I was like what? But then it's like oh like. You know, on Rosh Hashanah, you have honey because it's sweet and you want like a sweet new year. And I was like, oh, OK, like I get it. So it's like yeah. food helps me understand <laughs> so much. And I think that's true for so many people. I think for like Jewish food, too, there's so much about survival in it. Mm, and, um, yes. you know, I, I I got to write there's a new cookbook out called the Jewish cookbook. <laughs> it's yes. a very straightforward yes. title. Um, it's a, it's an amazing book written by um, a woman named Leah, who's great. And I got to write the forward for the book and kind of reflect a lot on, on everything we're talking about. And, you know, when you talk about Jewish food, it's, you're talking about so many different types of food from, you know, there's Ashkenazi Jews, there's Sephardic Jews, mm-hmm. there's Mizrahi Jews, you know, from all different places. And, you know, Jewish people live in all parts of the world and it's like it's this food of a major Mm. diaspora so it's like food that people have held on to so they can hold on to themselves and like their culture and so it's like you know each little thing at a holiday is symbolic but it's also like the whole thing is symbolic like it's it's amazing yeah it's so beautiful to talk about connect the way that we connect with each other as humans like that that connecting in faith through this kind of food through the holidays is just so beautiful Um, Julia, I could go on all day here, (laughs) but, um, I'm going to ask two final questions. Sure. Yeah. Um, first, like, how do you feed people today? I'm so curious about that. Um, cause I'm sure there's a million ways, but like, what are the main ways that you feed people you love? And then like literally like the food? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And then. Yeah, I guess coming from a pastor, like that could mean anything. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I'm so curious, like, how do people feed you? Mm, that's such a nice question. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So, yeah, I would just like, I'm scanning through like my week, like a normal week and how I feed people. I, my, so my wife and I live, as I mentioned, in a rural area. So we eat most of our meals at home. Um, So every day, at least one of us cooks something. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we are always kind of feeding ourselves and each other. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's definitely like someone who feeds me a lot. (laughs) Um, And I would say the other kind of major thing is every every week, every Thursday morning, uh, Grace, my wife, and I do a volunteer shift at this uh, place near us called Angel Food East, which is basically Mm -hmm. like a local like Meals on Wheels program, Mm -hmm. essentially. And so we do the Thursday morning shift and we work with, uh, you know, a few other volunteers on our team. And we've been doing that for a couple of years. And during our shift, we make a meal from start to finish for like the 60 clients our you know, our group serves. 
Wow. And um, yeah, we make it kind of based on like whatever is left over or like whatever was donated mm -hmm. or, you know, it's like a funny process of figuring it out. And then we cook this meal and then we portion it, we package it. And then like this other group of volunteers comes to deliver all the meals. And it's just this great, great group. So yeah, every week we do that. We also do some volunteering with our local food pantry. Mm -hmm. um, and then we, I wouldn't say like we entertain, like we don't throw like dinner parties like mm -hmm. ever but we I mean maybe we used to but I feel like we're in this phase right now where we just like we usually have like a friend or a couple of friends over mm -hmm. for a meal probably like once a week or so um just like you know come on Sunday we're like I'm, I'll yeah. make extra whatever like yes. it's like no big deal and it's just um yeah it's a really important thing I think for us to be able to like open our home to to our friends and yeah we live a couple hours outside of New York City so we have and we moved from the city, and so we have friends who live in the city who will come visit and stay for like a weekend or something. So I love cooking when when people come, and yes. yeah. So those are I would say the ways I feed people, and then the ways people feed me. I mean, Grace literally makes me like mm. meals all the time, <laughs> and I love yeah. when she cooks, um, and I feel so taken care of. Mm. Um, but I would say, yeah, to me, the other ways I get fed feel like probably way more metaphorical. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I love um, conversations like this. <laughs> I mm -hmm. love getting to, I don't know if you feel this way, but it's like mm -hmm. I love hosting a podcast for that reason. Because yes. like when I yes. can connect with someone in that way and they're open to sharing stuff and like answering my questions, <laughs> it's like I, it feels like such a gift. So, yes. yeah. Yes. Exactly. I feel the luckiest to ask the questions and to sit down with people like just like this and just like you, because it really does feed the soul and the mm -hmm. body. So, yeah, totally right. The best meals are with your spouse and partner and loved one on the like average weeknight. Oh, they, totally. 100 percent. Yeah. I think that like dinner parties are everything. And I'm like planning my life from one dinner party to the next but it's like it really is Monday night mm -hmm. with my husband and puppy. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's I that, totally get it. Yeah. Yeah. I just I really... read there was just this article in the New York Times that not to like be morbid. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, but it was this beautiful, beautiful article that like a friend shared with me and I was just like crying reading it because mm -hmm. it was this piece about how people who have lost their spouses and it was about like mm. a bunch of older people and like about that mealtime is like the hardest thing and they were talking about just what you just said like that kind of like the everyday Monday night kind of dinner and like yeah. it was just such a the, oh, I could share it with you it's just such a beautiful Please. testament to like kind of like day-to-day -day life <laughs> and like yes. who you share it with and just what those like small routines and rituals are and yeah, anyway, I just read it earlier today, so yes. it's on my mind. So when you yes. say that, I'm like, oh my gosh, totally. Yeah, please. That sounds lovely. Julia, this has been so special. Thank you so much for oh, my pleasure. this time. My Thank pleasure. you for sharing your heart. You're just like the loveliest spirit and soul. And I can just, you just put so much like goodness and light into the world. And I'm a recipient of it. And of course, so many other people are. And I just... Thank you for that. Like, no, thanks for this this time you. and your kindness. And please keep going. Oh, that was so nice. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm glad <laughs> that's recorded. I'll listen to that one. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> great. Make it into like a little, <laughs> like a ringer for your phone or something. <laughs> no, you can just thank get you. that play I over really, and over. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Thank you so much.